Welcome to the Education Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Journal Club. Here in our PCRF Journal Club, we promote evidence-based practices by critically evaluating the latest science in emergency medical services. We hope our discussion will help advance EMS practice. Through the generous support of our sponsor, Limmer Education, we can make science more accessible and understandable. All right, welcome everyone to our September 2022 Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum, Education Research Journal Club. Big thank you to Limmer Education for providing support to our PCRF Journal Clubs, supporting that science of EMS and of course of EMS education. Now, uh, if we haven't told you, or if you didn't know about it, we do have a YouTube channel that you should check out. Uh, we can put that in the chat, that link in the chat. And this is where you can find our archives of past clinical and education research journal clubs, just in case you busy educators have to go or you haven't caught one of our past ones, check it out. Go to our uh, YouTube channel and you can see all the past ones that have started actually for this year. My name is Megan Corey and I'm joined here by David Page and by Katie O'Connor. And soon to join us will be the retired and buffed, fresh from his workout, Bill Toon. Uh, so he'll be coming in, in, uh, in a little bit so we can have a little um, discussion about this great article that we want to talk about uh, today. I'm really glad to have some of uh, uh, the panelists on today too because uh, we've got uh, Katie who's really practiced in simulation, some of the things that are uh, written here about best practices in education. We talk about a lot here. Um, I heard Dave Page's voice in reading some of the discussion, a great discussion section of this paper. So this is a paper that's in pre-hospital emergency care, and it is called A Comparison of Four Methods of Paramedic Continuing Education in the Management of Pediatric Emergencies. Uh, check it out, um, and we're going to talk about that today. If you are joining us live, uh, please use the chat to interact. And you can discuss the topic with other participants. You can use the questions area for questions directed at us, at the panel members. And if you hear something you like, please quote, tag, share it on your favorite social media site. Please use hashtag EMS research. And of course, we love it when you tag at PCRF at UCLA, uh, as well as our sponsor, Limmer Education. Uh, I'd like to actually first, before we get into this article, I'd like to ask our commander in chief here, uh, Dave Page, the director of the pre Care Research Forum, to tell us about this exciting stuff coming up at EMS World Expo, the International Scientific Symposium. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you, Megan. You do an awesome job at these, and I apologize when I can't. I can't get here every every time, but uh, this one is really interesting, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I would love to make sure that everybody knows the International Scientific Symposium, uh, co-located with the MS World Expo, is uh, rolling, rolling, and and uh, has 42 confirmed attendees. Uh, we are very excited. There are seven educational abstracts, 35 of uh, clinical. We have sessions all throughout, and uh, if you're going to be in Orlando, please let us know. Please come to the sessions. Please support this. We will not uh, be broadcasting the live sessions, uh, but we hope that we can do some interviews and get the uh, authors to discuss a little bit of their work. There are some abstracts in here that are groundbreaking and really, really could affect patient care if actually people use the evidence, right? Uh, so it's not just enough to, to think about it and do the research, but if we do the research and nobody ever pays attention to it, then what are we all about? So I do hope that um, uh, people pay attention to what's being uh, presented there. Uh, there are implications, I know for me, in, in our current environment about what paramedics can and can't do or what they carry and don't carry and how they're trained. And if people are, are reading the research, they would kind of, their eyes should pop out and go, wow, okay, uh, very exciting stuff. We actually just wrapped up an ESO workshop that we do with uh, PCRF and ESO. Uh, we did one in May and those projects will be presented at the International Scientific Symposium at ISS. 
So uh, we just wrapped up a second one yesterday in Austin, Texas. And once again, uh, I want to thank ESO, the connection to HDE health uh, outcomes. So the hospitals are returning uh, information about what happens to those pre-hospital patients now give us the ability to do research that actually connects the patient care that we do in the field with outcomes. Do the patients live or die? Do they stay in the hospital longer or shorter? And um, what do we know uh, about even just some of the diagnostics, but some of the care that we provide? So uh, these are exciting times when it comes to pre-hospital care research. And if you are going to be anywhere near Orlando, please, please attend the International Scientific Symposium uh, and participate in the next ESO PCRF workshop, which we hope to be next spring in preparation again for, uh, for abstracts. So uh, this is an exciting time and we really, really want to welcome you and, and have you participate in all of the activities that are, that are happening. Very, very fun. Awesome. This is great. And and don't forget, we can also, um, we can post from there in social media. So you can kind of follow us on social media. If we find something really cool. Um, and of course, I'm going to be looking at those education research abstracts, listening to the oral presentations for some little pearls out there. Um, we'll definitely share those. So keep an eye on social media if you can't make it in person. And, and we'll be sharing some of that through through the social media. We'll have a discussion too next month. We'll bring up a few things that we learned from, from the conference. So great, great stuff. Congratulations to all the authors too who got their posters and, and oral presentations accepted. So let's move on to this important study. Because continuing education is such a hot topic right now with, with all the staffing shortages and the pressure on, on all of you out there who are running agencies and trying to keep education right at the forefront as, as a really important factor when you're probably fighting the, well, we gotta get them back on the street to run all these calls. So, but we do know that maintaining skills in these high stakes, low frequency patient events is, is a concern. I mean, we know we've talked about it here. The prior research uh, shows significant skills decay, it, you know, sometimes within as, as little as three months to six months after a training session. So some techniques in education that we also know, and we've talked about it a lot here, uh, that support greater retention and deeper learning. Um, and, and then maybe hopefully that will translate into the later things like better patient treatments and clinical practices, and of course, better patient outcomes. And then we're gonna talk about that uh, today too. And also maybe better um, you know, return on investment, we'll, we'll mention that too. Hopefully Bill will come in on that one, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, so we know that some of those techniques involve things like simulation-based learning, simulation-based mastery learning, um, that again, in a variety of different areas and, and sometimes in EMS as well, have been shown uh, to improve retention. So what this research group did was they wanted to address this problem specifically of skills decay and deficiency in working paramedics in the area of pediatric emergencies. So they wanted to compare the effectiveness of four types of training, and this was so continuing education, for identifying knowledge and skills deficiencies that were determined at a baseline in the management of pediatric emergencies. So this was five EMS agencies, and I'll uh, take a few through just a couple tables and we'll, we'll talk, because we want to get to the results, but we want to talk about some of the implications here too. So, um, there's five EMS agencies, this is done in Michigan. These are representative of rural, suburban, and urban areas. The, in Michigan, by the way, it's important to know that there are standardized state protocols. So that actually um, is an important thing in this. So you, we, we can kind of assume that uh, within reason that, that uh, we're following sort of the similar or, or exact protocols uh, among these agencies. Uh, and if you guys know more about Michigan, you can come in or people that are out there, you can pipe in in the uh, comments area. So the, these are, uh, they are also, by the way, similar in the pediatric percentage. They did, a, they really did a lot of detailed homework on this. Um, so every time you had a question reading this paper, it, there it would come up, you know, well, what about this? And it, they would come up. So they looked at pediatric populations in terms of the, the responses, pediatric responses, and the percentages were equal across. So we're looking at pretty much like-like systems. We don't know it at an individual level, but um, you know, that, that'll be a, a limitation maybe. Um, 
so what they did was they recruited these participants so it is a recruitment so we're going to have some selection um you know questions about the participants but recruited participants for this before and after study so what they did here you can see and i think this um figure says a lot was they did a baseline assessment and the baseline assessment um i believe can oh, actually i'm sorry they the all of the groups went through a pep course first so there was a PEP course, um, and this was the, um, you know, if, if people aren't familiar with pediatric education for pre-hospital professionals, uh, it's a, a standard um, training course in pediatrics um, that is, it, it's like PALS, but it has more of the uh, different modules on um, other areas um, like abuse and neglect and, and other things like that. So the PEP course, and then um, they there was a time period that went by um, and you can see it over on the left, there's the timeline, and they had a pre-intervention evaluation. So these were um, baseline assessments. So they did a baseline assessment, and I believe that consisted of three simulations um, that the, the each individual ran. So they didn't run them in teams, so uh, each individual participant who volunteered, um, they went through the baseline assessment and they were scored. Uh, based upon a clinical uh, criteria that they had. So this there was an evaluation um, matrix that they had that they used um, that was standardized and validated before. So uh, there was baselines taken on everyone, and then uh, there was a time period that went by. And actually, before that, they developed an education modules based on the deficiencies identified. So this is actually a, a study on how does remediation work, remediation education work. So, Dave, do you have something? <clears throat> yeah, I, just quickly because you mentioned it, and it, it's worth noting that these authors in 2009 published a, a rubric and a and and a validation of how to measure this. So, uh, so in the in the uh, references, and I'll put the reference into the into the chat here in a second. Lammers published something called simulation-based assessment of paramedic pediatric resuscitation skills. And um, for those educators on the call, one of the uh, things that gives us better inter-rater reliability and um, hopefully better assessment overall is that we choose binary, easily identifiable, yes or no, positive, negative, was the this performed, was it not performed? So I do uh, think it, it's worth noting that um, they've been at it for a while, so kudos to them for building on previous research and using a tool that they first validated and, you know, also put us all, all of us on notice that uh, instead of just filling out whatever checklists, there are validated checklists when it comes to competency during simulation that at least in pediatric uh, and particularly pediatric resuscitation have been uh, validated. Uh, just before we dive into more of these methods, I, you know, I think it's worth noting the high, high um, acuity, low frequency. Uh, we were just at the at the ESO workshop finding uh, barely 300 cardiac arrests within a population of nearly uh, what would have been, it, it was less than 1% is what it was. So millions of cardiac arrests out there, millions of records, hundreds of thousands of cardiac arrests, but only only two to 300 spread amongst tens of thousands of EMS providers. So this concept that um, we're going to see a cardiac arrest is, you know, in the field is really gone. It should be gone from anybody who's teaching. And really what we're talking about is, uh, the need for this uh, understanding about exactly how high fidelity or low fidelity, which is I think uh, really cool that they that they differentiated between these skill only high fidelity low fidelity uh, is going to be effective at maintaining these types of high acuity low frequency skills. Okay, yeah. that's all. Yeah, no, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, th that that also supports them as a as a research group going forward. So developing all of doing all of the front work on identifying and validating um, the tools that you're going to use uh, helps you then later, you know, reduce the number of limitations that you have after you've done your next step. I do feel like we're we're joining them kind of in the middle of this movie. 
and I can't wait to see how it ends when they get to the the, the next studies that they're doing, which um, you can see where they're headed, uh, even though even if they don't say it um, completely uh, clearly in the in the end of this paper. So that that was the thing I think I was most impressed with was that this you know instead of just doing the education you know splitting them up, doing an intervention and measuring it, they took the time to do you know get everybody kind of zeroed out everyone's doing the pep course and which is not required in michigan and then having a pre-intervention baseline doing baseline assessments everyone does these uh, three scenarios or uh, and we have these this tool to evaluate them then based on that developing the educational module i thought that was cool too they developed the, the module development the the things that they were going to look at um, from the deficiency identified in during the baseline. So what were the areas of deficiency, whether they were knowledge and skills deficiencies? So we see skills and that word sometimes can can conjure up in our heads because of our backgrounds in, in, uh, in our field, the highly technical procedural aspects of things. But skills can mean a lot of things. So um, just know that that's, they mean more than you know how to start an IO. So the educational module development was based on the deficiencies, um, and they had a, a lot of scrutiny around it, a lot of you know inter-rate reliability checks. Um, they also mentioned, you know, and I really appreciated this, Dave. They talked about, you know, look, a lot of this stuff has been based on expert consensus opinion, and all I could think is if I read one more Delphi study. <laughs> So, and no offense to Delphi studies, but if I read one more about everybody, it's what we have to do when we need opinions. But uh, you know, let's try and do it with with a little bit more of the kind of a scientific process and and prospectively studying this. So it's it's yeah. really good. I I also think so for those that might not be able to see the study. Um, these are again binary applied oxygen didn't apply oxygen it's a it's a it's a resuscitation scenario it's an asthma scenario which I really appreciated because uh, I, I do think we could just go into resuscitation a lot more and asthma is a lot more common right respiratory distress and sepsis seizure so they combine sepsis and seizure which I thought was interesting as well but the uh, the 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 concept of um, uh, measurement of the right dose was really present, which I really appreciate as well. We've seen many studies that show that we're not able to calculate doses for kids. So their, their uh, use of a system in order to be able to capture the right, the right dose was really powerful. I, I, I don't know what you think, but I, I did think that already you know and they did a power calculation so for those that aren't uh, familiar with research you know trying to power the study correctly is really interesting and the slide that's in front of you now shows 200 people completing a pep course from five different ems agencies so this is uh you know very nicely done the thing that worried me here is that the the, uh, the entire thing is conducted over two and a half years. Yeah. And so um, there are very short interventions, uh, you know, less than it's it's an hour uh, session over two and a half years. And um, and they tested them within four, four to six months. And so, you know, it's a dose effect kind of a situation. Uh, you know, we, if we, if we, how, how uh, the bump in education or the bump, how therapeutic is it? I think of it just like a pharmacology or medication uh, kind of study. You think uh, how much of the dose, how much of the medication did they get and did they get the therapeutic? Um, you know, do you really, can you learn to ride the bicycle and then forever ride the bicycle? Or do you need to, you know, get on the bicycle fairly frequently in order to keep being able to ride the bicycle? So the therapeutic dose uh, here uh, worries me, and and I don't just mean dose of pediatric, uh, you know, medications. I mean dose of education, the number of hours, the frequency of those hours, and the type of education. And um, uh, and and we I know I see the the names of the educators on this on this very journal club, and I know they have access to more than 200 students a year uh, who 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 they can do this study on. So think about replicating these methods with the students that you have. Okay. 
Yeah, no, and I think I love your analogy of the dose response, and I like your analogy of the is this one of those skills, you know, or, or which one of these skills are like the bicycle skill where I, you know, I do remember that after I hit a certain point and I remember that for a long period of time, but I think it also depends upon the race you're running to. <laughs> how how good do I have to be at riding the bike? Am I just going to the store or am I in a race for, and this is a pediatric call. I would say this is a pretty tough race. So, yeah. and not what we do all the time. So that that's, um that, yeah, I think there are a lot of factors, but I, I like the way you put that, the dose response, because that's the idea of the distributed education, which we talk about. And that's what they decided, look, this is already demonstrated that distributed education is more effective than packing it in and doing a one-time thing. So it's these the were drip instead of the bolus, right? Yes, you know, exactly. drip, 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 you know, over long times. Are you teaching pharmacology this semester? <laughs> I love it. I'm just gonna keep going with it. I'm gonna keep going with it. In, until Bill Toon unmutes and cuts me off, I'm just gonna go with it. Until I pit you guys against each other, we're going to go. But I do like that. So what we're talking about about the infusion is that it's an infusion of uh, one hour sessions five times through this time period, which is, you know, every it, it works out to be every um, two to four months, I believe they have a and I might have that wrong, but it's, it's they have a one hour session. What's different among the groups is the mode of delivery. So the education and the, uh, you know, the the identified, the pre and post, what we're gonna evaluate, the deficiencies identified early, we're gonna measure those things, or they did post uh, performance evaluation, but the delivery model, how do we deliver and how, or whatever you wanna call it, I don't even like the, the term delivery, cause it sounds like I'm giving you, right? That's that whole old fashioned, you know, teaching methodology, open your heads and I'll pour it in. So um, no, but th this, these are the different ways, teaching is a, or is a technique, not a technology or simulation is. Um, and this is when I wanna bring Katie in too, cause Katie is our simulation um, you know, person here. We talk a lot about simulation here and we were uh, chatting about the use of the word fidelity here, which I really, really appreciated them taking the time out to go into that in this paper. It's something we have to keep mentioning in EMS uh, over and over again. So especially as we bring up new educators, what is the definition of fidelity? So let me just run through the, the groups in case people aren't seeing the slides or don't have the paper. It's not an open access paper, but um, it is in pre-hospital emergency care. So somebody running around, you should have it. Uh, there's a control group, which did the online PEP refresher. And again, this is same thing. These were five one hour sessions over you know, this time period. There was a standard, um, you know, lecture and pr procedural skills lab group that's at LPSL, sometimes called SPSL in their paper. I think sometimes they call it standard, sometimes they call it lecture, procedural skills lab, which is lecture, lectures, pretty standard, 30 minutes of lecture, 30 minutes of skills lab. Then there was another group that had, and these were randomized, by the way, so the, the uh, students or the participants were randomized. Then there was the low fidelity simulation group that had education modules that were delivered through a uh, video, uh, just a 10 minutes uh, with a 10 minute with a demo, and then of, of how to manage a pediatric patient in one of the different simulations. And then they had a low fidelity simulation, and then there was a high fidelity simulation group, education modules. And high fidelity. Again, one hour, one hour. And individuals, individuals. Into the session, not teams. So they went in with an actor as their uh, partner um, and they were videotaped or observed um, uh, or both. Uh, in most cases, they were both videotaped and observed and then they were scored um, uh, uh, as they, you know, in the post intervention evaluation. So, um, but the trainings, to, these are the training groups, the high fidelity simulation, low fidelity simulation, lecture procedural skills lab group and control group. And each one received a one hour um, session distributed over uh, five sessions over um, two years, basically. So um, Katie, can I bring you in on, on let's, on talking about yeah. what, the, what the authors, how they uh, used it and then how they defined it, uh, the two different types of simulation in particular. Yeah, th so when they're saying high fidelity sim, they're really talking about fancy mannequin sim is um, how I would say it. When, when we're talking about fidelity, really what that term just means is how close to realistic is it? Um, and they actually in their analysis talk about how, you know what, it probably doesn't really matter what mannequin we use. It really matters how realistic this is to 
field and how well does it translate to the job that we do? Um, and you kind of see that through some of the questions they're asking and then some of the um, discussion, which we'll get to. But when we're thinking about fidelity, I think as educators, we really need to think of, is this training what I want it to do? Is this going to translate to practice? And sometimes that means a fancy mannequin, but other times that might mean a role player or a well-trained role player, like a standardized patient or simulated patient. That could be more of a high fidelity than a mannequin. And I think especially when we're talking about like um, a patient assessment where it's about the conversation with the patient or maybe a psychiatric call where we're really trying to show those kinds of speech patterns and behavior patterns that no offense to any particular plastic person, they're just really not great at responding well to our questions and assessments. They do a really bad job of grimacing. Um, you know, they try, hand it off to the mannequins, they're trying their best. Um, but then other things too, like even if we're talking about airway management, right? Some of those really high fidelity trainers that you can intubate have terrible neck mobility. So mm -hmm. if you're trying to teach neck mobility, a high fidelity might actually be something else, not the you know mannequin that talks and bleeds and exhales CO2 and all of those things. So fidelity is important with the learning objective. And they say this in the paper too. So I just think it's really important to remember high fidelity does not mean a specific type of technology. It's dedicated to the learning objective we're trying to reach. Or and don't forget, I, I know you 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 uh, you say it all the time, and maybe maybe I just didn't hear it this time. But the environment, so right, so the role players and the confederates about you know how what's going on around you, but just even being able to create an environment in which you have a teddy bear and a crib and some kids' toys has a tremendous impact. And and just to quote Megan Corey yesterday, I love uh, Vygotsky and the zone of proximal development, in case people haven't, I'll put the link in the chat, but this was a different uh, webinar about preceptors, but, but this zone of proximal development and scaffolding means that we increasingly make the simulation be more and more real, and, and that, that, that input that we have from all of these different uh, uh, external sources, whether it's environment or another person, or you know grimacing, these these things add to cognitive load during the simulation. So we don't want to go white and just completely go deer in the headlights and not not just not able to be seeing anything other than our own adrenaline. And I don't know, I don't know that we repeat these simulations well enough, deep enough. Uh, that we are actually learning to ride the bicycle so we can do it later, long term later, you know, uh, when when we see that patient. So uh, the the and they like like Kitty said, it's in the it's in their discussion about how much of that fidelity needs to really be about the you know the the educational environment and the type and the repetition of these, the depth of the of the scenario. If we try to do too much with a cardiac arrest and we're, there's just too many different skills, too many different pieces to the puzzle, then you're barely even learning to put the pieces of the puzzle together and you can't really do it when some, you know, uh, absolutely normal emotional response is happening around you, whether it's providers that are panicking because it's a child or parents that are parent that are panicking because it's their child. So it's um, I think that it 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 really isn't all about the 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 plastic people. I love that. I love that. You know, just well, nothing against plastic people. Right. <laughs> We're equal well, lovers of all people. <laughs> well those puzzle pieces you're mentioning and actually Dan Batesy is putting put a comment in the chat for everyone too is that we really think about this as a team sport, I think is the way uh, Heather says it, like EMS is a team sport. Um, and part of the fidelity is, do you have a team with you, right? If we're learning just how to do a basic skill, great, learn how to do it by yourself. But we're talking about pediatric resuscitation, which is multiple people doing multiple things and paramedics could be the team leader there. If we're testing people as individuals and, and having our team be silent automatrons that can't say anything, or we don't even have a team we're verbalizing and pretending. I think a lot of the scripts have like, you have three people trained to your ability, they'll do whatever you say they will do. 
um, we're not, that's not fidelity for our, our real clinical environment. And so I think Dan makes a great point. Dave, you're making a great point. Part of the puzzle piece is the people involved. In yeah, and, and it's it's kind of our own fault in some ways because we now even if we emphasize teamwork and we and we bring uh, students in in teams and and encourage and and we evaluate them in teams, they we still send them out as individuals on an internship. So um, we you know and they and expect individual performance as a team leader. So I guess um, and I and I, I don't think that necessarily you know it's not binary. There's there's levels there, but. Um, it's interesting. I think it's very important to remember that this is a continuing education study. So this is these are already practicing um, EMS providers. These are paramedics, and you'll see, uh, I think, at the next table that they, you know, they were equal across groups in terms of their uh, years of experience too. And they found no difference when it comes to their performance outcomes um, by difference by years of experience, no matter what group they were in. So. That I thought that was also a very important thing because, of course, that comes up in you know you think well the more what if there were more experienced people in the group that showed improvement and um, and it turned out they compared both the the, the numbers of people within the groups um, and then the overall if you had your more years of experience were you more likely to improve and they didn't see anything so um, I think but to, to remember that this is a continuing education study is important because. We don't know, like again, going back to the pharmacology analogy, we don't know do it do students who need to be scaffolded, do they need that that bolus at the end of the ultra higher fidelity, you know, and and by that I don't mean technology, but again, higher realism with the emotional elements and all those things to get them to um competency uh in and if they're not going to get it in the clinical setting especially in the case of a pediatric or in the um, field uh before they become a licensed provider and then then it's maintenance infusions like this this is the maintenance infusion over time you know how to keep somebody there uh you know we, we don't know that so again if you're if you're thinking about this in terms of initial education and this may be the the scaffolding approach and maybe this chart is is more vertical than it is horizontal like this um yeah but but they they do both things like you um like you and dave had said they do both things they, they define fidelity later on they talk about look fidelity is realism and encompasses everything uh, you know the level of reality but the most important i have like lines in here that are circled and and uh, and one of them is that i think there was you were mentioning it, katie the importance of mannequin or scenario realism depends on the instructional objectives and educational context we can't hammer that enough um, when people create simulations is it is anchored by what your intent is and so i think that's what i was really impressed about is they had clear intent they had defined it in the baselines they looked right at where are the deficiencies these are practicing paramedics Let's go for the areas where they need improvement and see which modality of education will help us with the, the most improvement. If we use, and they just assume distributed education is going to be better than bolus, you know, two days of, of education, um, which again brings to mind, we hear this one over and over again, and yet we still run two day ACLS classes, PHTLS classes. Uh, we even see some sort of barriers sometimes in these instructor manuals, you know, that thou shalt follow this agenda um, and little kind of soft words about well you can do distributed there's been evidence shown that distributed is better and and yet we still don't really see that and uh, I'm just gonna throw that out there for everybody so these were the education modules um, this is the what you guys had mentioned the cardiac arrest pediatric respiratory failure um, this this was in the uh, uh, in the paper and then here's the numbers of years of experience by um, by group, you had in the high fidelity, low fidelity simulation, the lecture um, procedural skills lab, and the control group, which was the online uh, refresher module. And you can see there's no difference. Um, you notice the number of subjects is lower than in the original um, that, that uh, flow chart. And that's because, of course, there's going to be attrition. I thought that was a really interesting section, too. I don't know about you guys, but the attrition um, section, they, they went out and, and figured out why did people attrit, you know, why did you lose um, certain people and they had, or why did you lose, you know, 50 people in the study? And um, it was, you know, a lot of the same reasons we see just sort of in general, medical leave and uh, personal uh, change of job, uh, change of career, 
you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, medical leave changes in employment and family issues. And then just one, one of the instructors also uh, left. And remember, these went to EMS instructors to carry out the education that they were trained. So what'd you think of that, um, Dave? When I saw that attrition, I was really glad they went that far and told us why. So they helpful. It's so helpful because some studies you see, well, we started with 200 and we finished with 150 subjects and, you know, who knows what happened. Um, and and I think if we're going to talk about, um, you know, the 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 how heavy of a lift it is to educate people to the level of competence uh, or teams, this concept that the individual, which Dan Batesy keeps keeps uh, mentioning in the in the questions is just a, it's a thank you, Dan, because that's really important here. Uh, the, the concept that we keep uh, focusing on individual competence uh, leads us to, you know, individuals come and go and, and really it's systems, teams, right, um, that need to continue to interact. So if we build a system where teams can actually, you know, pass on uh, institutional knowledge and, and their expertise, then we are less likely to have a novice team leader who really can, you know, screw it up because they're not really listening to the rest of a of a team, regardless of their level of, of education. Uh, there are EMTs that are going to be much calmer and more aware of, of, you know, all of the parts of a resuscitation, and if especially if they've got experienced kids and have participated. So it, it is kind of an interesting uh, uh, concept here about why people attrit and. Uh, you know, maybe we should be happy as educators that we're always going to have students, but it's a little bit of a sad uh, comment on the profession itself when uh, all of the, you know, brain trust is is uh, leaving and difficult to get back into, you know, one spot. I, I wish Bill Toon would unmute a bit because um, uh, one of the things that Johnson County Med Act put together is a roving battalion chief educator who who could go to find the the crews while they're on duty and do do simulation or rotate crews through simulations. So you could uh, you know hopefully in a, on a regular basis keep hitting at you know it's your turn to go if you're a police officer you, you just kind of rotate into the range and you shoot your gun and you make sure you can still hit the target and it's just a regular thing it's normal um, so if we can normalize that experience instead of thinking now i go to an eight hour continuing education day oh my goodness that like poke my eyes out i'm gonna have to listen to some educator tell me all about the dose, which I'm not, I'm not going to actually be able to hold and touch. And, and, and um, so I, you know, I think it's uh, uh, really, really helpful when we think of it as a cyclical pattern that's systematized and normalized and, uh, and, and team-based. It's a commitment. It's a commitment by putting money into education. It's there great to say, it's great to say that you do it, but when you have one educational coordinator for 250 employees, that's not a commitment. So how did they do that? They, so MedAct put together a, a, an educator for each shift and gave them a vehicle or a, a simulate, like did they go in an ambulance with a mannequin or, because they, they really kind of invested in that. So it, at, things have changed of course over time, but when I was there, you're correct, each shift had a, a battalion chief of training. So they had full operational capabilities, which we rarely used. But we did have uh, vehicles that we could carry equipment with. Or if we wanted to bring an ambulance, we did have a training ambulance that we could bring. That's if we wanted to do station-based training. Mm -hmm. uh, often what we would do is we'd move around the county and set up shop and uh, different training with different fire departments because the fire departments always trained with the ambulance. It was never just the, the ambulance mm -hmm. alone. And so we always had the fire departments in their training so we could do team-based training. So right. that was a, a very valuable thing, but it, it, it's, cost exp it, it's costly. You know, you've got to be able to, to, to make the, the commitment to it. So we had um 
we had the, the ability to bring units in working with the operational chiefs so we could rotate units in, we could take them out of service, you know, to bring them in for training. We would put up extra units if we were going to pull in too many units. You know, we had all sorts of criteria we work with, but it's the willingness to make that commitment. And it, it, it was a big deal. I, I can tell you that within a year of me retiring, they had done away with everything except one person. <clears throat> and only in recent years have they, they built themselves back up. And so the, it, it waxes and wanes depending upon the commitment for money. Luckily for me, for the 20 years I was there, we had a, a full staff. And so we, and then the commitment was also the assistant chief was the assistant chief in the department was the assistant chief of education. And he, he sat on the senior management team. So again, if you're if the people that are doing education aren't sitting at the table right at the very top, that talks about the culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you got to be willing to put your money. You got to really put your money in it. But it's not just the money. Do they devote all the resources? And I was very fortunate for the time I was there. We had all the resources that we needed. We always wanted more, but we could never complain about what we had. Um, and the better the better thing is to look at is is the employees did they like it or not like it and uh, you know the majority of it did like it they liked it particularly the more hands on we made it yeah, yeah. We'll get into the likes though too there's there's some down I mean not down downsides to it there's always upsides to evaluating how people like something but we've seen several times and we see it in this one too how much more confident are you how much do you like it and we see oh every group across the board is I'm just as confident as, you know, the next person and I liked it just as much. And yet the outcomes themselves don't show that they show a big difference. Yeah. So I love the table you've got here uh, to get back to the, the paper here. The uh, it's interesting that the that low fidelity simulation had an impact. So if you were waiting to hear about the drum roll, please, the results low fidelity was what had the impact now it's a it's a small impact but still an impact and you have to put that in context here because the uh, uh the number of people that did the control group which is also sort of an interesting thing there's also there's almost uh, 11 people fewer that maintain control in that were that stayed in the control group which makes you think about online lecture and how attrition works when people are not really feeling uh, like they're, you know, really participating. I really wonder. But look yeah. at the 4.0 median years of experience um, in the low fidelity group. And that's the group that really, where really things did actually show. So I wish we had the authors here to ask them, you know, is that is that correlated? Is there is there a concept here that perhaps the uh, the folks that had more experience maybe didn't get as much uh, you know of a benefit from this particular type of education, but um, but those that have fewer years of experience maybe did. Yeah, they didn't find them in intergroup, but um, and as uh, Dave said, so going to the the outcomes, and then I do want to come back to that cost issue because return on investment is one thing that is not measured that we do need to start making a state statement on. They do talk about the cost of you know the challenges of cost, but but uh, return on investment is an outcome measure. It's a late outcome measure. Um, so, but it's something that that we need to probably start you know thinking about more. But this the performance outcomes they had two main things um and then the third was the uh the uh feelings of the the participants and how they felt about their training so the first is the performance outcomes uh no difference in the baseline uh across the board so that was good among the people that were randomized to the different groups uh, so we had a nice even starting and no difference in scores by group for the individual scenarios um, pre and post. So we're looking at pre uh, training and then post training for each of the groups and then each of the scenarios. So they looked at differences within each type of scenario and then combine intragroup scores. But when you combine the scores, only the low fidelity simulation showed a significant uh, improvement. And just kind of going back to that uh, idea of fidelity, th they did because fidelity is about realism and because they were using uh, pediatric scenarios where the pediatric patient is unresponsive, the fidelity, you know, arguably the develop, 
fidelity increases, the less you have to intervene with the, and say, hey, the patient's see, or, you know, doing something. Actually, on all of these, you have to say that because even the high fidelity ones don't do great seizures, but they, they do get pulses and breathe and, and things like that. So you, the less intervention you have to have, um, they call that higher fidelity. So you're talking about the, you know, the sim baby that has the breathing and the pulses as high fidelity, whereas the ALS baby, well, the one that doesn't get breathing impulses, but you can hook it up to a, a rhythm generator um, and stand back a little bit. That's considered a low fidelity in their um, discussion here. Yeah, I feel like we need to be careful here. Uh, and and Katie was alluding to it before, and I hope she jumps in here too. This yeah. concept that high fidelity is sim man and above, you know, the Gamard super super duper uh, mannequin. I think is is a is a stereotype about the use of the word fidelity and high fidelity. So I, I do want to be careful that this in this paper they defined it as such, because what they're calling low fidelity, my other many other people may not be able to even achieve if they don't have that higher level of ALS simulated you know plastic mannequin. So there are ways uh, we've seen that with other manufacturers like iSimulate, where we can uh, take plastic that doesn't appear to be doing anything and be able to give it life with external external uh, devices. So I do feel that, uh, and there, I have no conflict of interest on, on any of those uh, fronts. I just think the uh, it's very it, it's not not great that we keep drawing the line to. High fidelity means you have a control room and somebody's speaking through a microphone. Um, and as you said, if the mannequin generates a blood pressure or is breathing, there are ways to do that with low tech that make it more high fidelity. Um, I think they try to explain that in here, though. They said for this purpose, we had to, we were using this definition. And then later on, they say, although, you know, that's not really the definition of fidelity. And incidentally, another great reference is the, um, I can't remember what it's called, Agency for Health Quality Research, mm -hmm. Health Research yeah, Quality, two, yeah. the second edition of the Simulation Dictionary. That's mm -hmm. a great resource, and you can just go right in there and read Fidelity, the definition of Fidelity. But I think and, they- And the COE, right? The COE yeah. just published uh, an EMS specific, you know, sort of better definition for some of those AHRQ and, and uh, um, simulation dictionary pieces so that, that are just specific to us. So uh, yeah, Katie now got so excited, she turned on her camera. See, I, I knew it, I knew it. I thought we could get there. I have to hold it, I haven't quite set my office up yet. No, one of the things I wanted to say is they mentioned this in their limitations when we're looking at this data that some of it could be the fact too that people aren't used to high fidelity simulators or the educators are having trouble using them. So even if you can, you know, spend the money or whatever you have the resources for, if you don't have the training or your learners aren't engaged with it because they don't know how it works, they're not familiar with it, you actually lose fidelity. Yeah. So you could spend all this time trying to up the fidelity, up the fidelity, up the fidelity from a design point. But if we're not using that technology the right, safe way, we could actually it's create- back to Kim McKenna's product. super study. It's the yes. super study. Yeah. The, where are the high fidelity mannequins in the closet because we don't know how to use them. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Or the students don't know. I mean, if you've ever tried to listen to those lung sounds on the mannequin for like the asthma one, maybe they're actually listening to the compressor. So we don't know that this, for we don't know for sure that the reason they didn't do better in the asthma is because they weren't, they were unsure of the lung sounds from the machine versus the compressor that was making the lungs rise, right? There's all this artifact. So I just think it's worth saying there, they say it in the paper directly that it's the ability to repeat your training, to engage with the feedback, and it's the repetitive practice is more important than any piece of technology that we could use. Um, and the instructors providing that feedback is the most important part. Yeah, I would venture to say even just checking blood pressures on pediatric patients, babies especially, is a challenge. I mean, even even without any um, major critical piece, I see routinely my 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 partners are just like we don't check blood pressures on kids. It's like they're awake and they've got a pulse and they're breathing, and then you know this whole blood pressure thing, well, forget about it. So how are we supposed to do that if we're not even doing it on people? And then we're we're having trouble with the with the plastic. I I am null at taking an adult blood pressure 
on SimMan. It's like, where do I put the stethoscope exactly to get the right little thing? You know, so uh, I, I do think, um, you know, again, there's new technology, Bluetooth stethoscopes really could change the way we do simulation if we are, you know, going to actually guide ourselves with best evidence and best practices, we should be doing studies that say, how, how does this work? Does, is it working better? So you too can be a researcher. I, I, there are people on the call, I, I see your name. I'm not gonna out you, but I know that you could do some of these studies uh, and some of them multi-center in multiple schools. So I uh, really hope that, that you're hearing this and going, we could do something very simple and very useful with this. This is such a great paper too. If you read the discussion segment, they take the time to go through best practices in education and great, great uh, references in here. So references to things like um, uh, distributive learning and deliberate practice and th things like that we've talked here because Katie mentioned repetition. That tends to be something that, that we do too is, you know, okay, the student learns how to uh, do a skill and then they repeat, repeat, repeat. And if you don't get that targeted feedback, you know, each time and then you build on, you know, that effortful um, practice where you are, your goal directed, I need to improve upon this deficiency or this area of improvement, um, you know, then it's just repeating mistakes over and over again and carrying those into the field and continuing them. So that, that all of those things, we, you know, I think was, it's just a great um, section what do you to think about some best practices too. What do you think about this conclusion uh, uh, that, um, you know, was sort of depressing overall? I mean, we, 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 it's great to see low fidelity really worked. Um, and, you know, I, I loved that they said, you know, expensive high fidelity simulators, and I'm quoting, were not necessary for teaching pediatric resuscitation skills to paramedics. Uh, I just found it to be rather depressing that, um, that it basically says, you know, two hours of training in pediatric emergencies per year was insufficient. Yeah. And so, so um, you know, it really begs to, uh, you know, the question that's that's already in the question uh, and answer area here is is how much, how much is necessary? They do say though, like it's not completely pessimistic. They're like, look, even a little bit of work is worth it. Like something's happening. There's a little improvement. It may not be getting to where we need to be, but don't stop trying. So I do want to like throw out to the educators. Don't like, throw some awesome baby people. out with a bathwater. Is that, that yeah. that's <laughs> right? Small differences could be helpful. There's there's something happening. Maybe we just don't have the large enough data or sample size, or we're not doing it enough times. But mm -hmm. like your work is worth something. <laughs> don't give up. Yeah, and also, I mean, this is we have to keep in mind. This is one subject area in, you know, among all of the different subject areas for continuing education. So if you're a CE trainer out there, um, you know that, look, this is one topic and I've got pressure from all different areas that I've got to not only do topics on, you know, clinical practice, but also on safe driving and, you know, and other things, um, health and, and HR issues and policies and all that other stuff that they, that they have to you know, get through. So there's all of these little things um, that have to come into it. So I do, and they they really, they highlight that, they recognize it, which I, I appreciate because sometimes we can get in our little corner and, and become zealots about our one thing and then realize, well, you know, we better back up and see what everybody's really dealing with in the real world. So this is that table of the targeted skills. So the first one was the performance outcomes and the combined scores, only the low fidelity simulation, so it showed significant improvement. This one is the targeted skills and the significant score differences um, were shown in the sepsis and seizure group for high fidelity and low fidelity simulation and in the cardiac arrest um, group for the low fidelity simulation. None, no, you know, here you go, Dave, with your, um, your uh, discussion on asthma, there was no difference in, in for, for any of the asthma uh, patients here, which is an interesting thing too. I'm, I'm curious about that one because, you know, asthma arguably could be, you you, you don't need a, a, a mannequin for an asthma uh, call unless it's status asthmaticus and their altered mental status or something. But if it's a straight- Well, yeah, but I also look at the criteria they used. So, you, you can, in table three, they go through like 26 items for cardiac arrest. 
um, versus uh, 15 and some uh, for asthma and some of the 15 here are just you know very simple like apply oxygen measure respiratory rate measure heart rate um, check level of consciousness so I feel like uh, what perhaps is happening is maybe we are you know it's it's a more simplistic approach to exactly what it is that you're supposed to do and so it, less complexity less data points less uh, 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 you know, calculations of drugs, and now we're, you know, probably uh, in an area of there isn't that much improvement because there's not that much to do. Yeah, yeah, and and there, the table three is not included in this. You know, I'm not, I didn't put it up here because it's so huge, but it's a task analysis. So they, mm. and there's a lot of tasks. If you look at them, there's a hundred and something for cardiac arrest, and I mean, there's a lot of t individual tasks that they had to look at and so the videotape i'm sure helped they actually when they go through you know pick up the paper read it we're short on time but read that and look at the uh, that section it's really detailed so some of the questions you might have about limitations you read the methods section and they really thought of uh, they thought of everything that i can think of um this is just the post intervention survey the survey results were interesting i, I looked over this a lot and it's like okay everything sort of hovers around the middle to you know, upper, yeah, I, I moderately or significantly learned more in each of the groups, and I'm somewhat more confident, <laughs> but it's pediatrics. I'm sure if it was an adult cardiac arrest, you'd probably see a little bit different in that confidence one, but um, yeah, so everybody feels like it was, uh, you know, beneficial. This is back to that original uh, table, just so we can kind of um, wrap up what they what they found. They did a great, you know, uh, calculation on error rate or reliability. My only question here, and I think Bill was getting at it, is what is the return on investment? And if you can prove a return on investment of something, um, that's gold. And if you're thinking, that, how can you do that? Um, I would encourage all of us to to look back. And I mentioned uh, Bill McGahey's work on this uh, webinar, which is from Northwestern. They have a simulation podcast, one of the many but they, um, it's a, it's a, I think it's comprehensive healthcare simulation of a book and a podcast that goes with it. And they talk about the work that was done in medical schools or in, in residency programs, I believe, and in a hospital on um, increasing the performance um, uh, on central line insertion through simulation-based mastery learning. And they showed a, a big difference in the types of training favoring simulation-based mastery learning. Not only did they do that, they showed that improved skills with um, central line insertion, reduced infections in patients. And then not only that, they showed, they did a cost analysis and found a, a tremendous return on investment and a reduction in cost from lower admission rates um, and that kind of thing. So I think that's something we have to always have on, on our uh, sites because, you know, as an educator, I, I could say this is the best thing, we should do this. and I think getting to Dan's thing, I think not just teamwork, but interprofessional teamwork is important. But it's one thing to beat the drum and say to our, if you're an educator in a college, to your deans and administrators, we need to do this for the good of humanity. And it's another thing to say, and by the way, here's the return on investment. Here's the cost savings that you'll have by lack, you know, lack of duplication of, of things that we do. And here's the, you know, whatever money it'll bring in or more money it'll save. Uh, that speaks volumes. So that's something I think we need to continuously think about. Um, Bill, do you have anything to add to that? I always think of you when I think of return on investment for some reason. No, I, I, most of us probably don't figure out what the cost is of art. And most people say, well, you're on salary, so that, that's a built-in cost. But how much of my time do I spend to develop a program, train assistants, purchase all the disposable stuff, and really look at the total piece of what it cost, but then you need to measure it up against outcome. I think, are you seeing a change in practice, actual practice? That's where the, the rubber meets the highway. So I think it's important to know how much you do, but then you can figure out, well, listen, for about a $2,000 investment or $1,500, whatever it might be, I can move the, the, the let's say, our, we'll just pick a, a, a simple skill, um, IV insertions, uh, we can decrease the number of attempts and increase first time success on IV insertion by investing at about 20,000, I mean, $2,000 in training. That would be very powerful to anyone if we are able to get to that level. Yeah, yeah. 
and that's I think that's we, we should be thinking of that because um, we tend to be just waving the flag of, of passion and, and money talks. Uh, Katie and Dave, do you have any last minute uh, things to say at the top of the hour here? I would just say that if you're spending money on something that's shown to not work, you need to reinvest that in something that is. So <laughs> stop paying for these hour long like CE things that people click through. Stop paying people to attend those. Right. Mm -hmm. Redirect that money to something else. Yeah, I am very encouraged by a study like this because we've been beating the drum about low simu low fidelity simulation uh, in terms of low low fidelity mannequins with high fidelity uh, of of uh, practice and uh, you know sort of train like you're going to fight uh, and practice like you're going to play, which was the title, the brilliant title that Megan you gave this particular day. I think that we need to go back to that and, and get instructors who are super familiar with simple tools that really immerse students in their learning and we will see results. So, um, yay. Yeah, thank you authors uh, of the paper. Um, we hope to catch up with you at some point and, and watch your research in the future. Great research article, get a hold of it. And thank you all for attending. We'll be back next month at the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Education Research Journal Club, along with Limmer Education, who brings us here on Friday, October 28th, 2022 at 10 a.m. Pacific noon central. But before then, you can join the wonderful Dr. Remley Crow and Dr. Tony Fernandez at the PCRF Clinical Journal Club on Monday, October 10th. If you're at EMS World, come by, see us, watch some abstracts. We want to see you, and we'll see you next month, if not. We hope you have enjoyed and learned from this PCRF Journal Club. Please share it with other interested EMS professionals. An archive of past journal clubs can be found at www.pcrfpodcasts.org. You can also find us on Facebook at PCRF at UCLA and on our website at www.prehospitalcare.org. A special thank you to our sponsor, Limmer Education, providing education tools for success at every stage of your EMS journey.